Okay, what's going on YouTube? This is your boy Jamari 4 here once again. Now, I know it's been quite a while since I put one of these out, but let me tell you, I actually had one that was like 48 minutes long, and I couldn't put it out because the recording software recorded it like too zoomed in, like it, it didn't record it right. Y'all couldn't even see half of what was happening, and I was so pissed. It was a great one, y'all. It was a great one that y'all will never see. <laughs> it was like a grinder date gone bad. It was it was a hot mess. But I couldn't put it out because it looked crazy. But it's truly a shame. I was so mad about that. But been a whole lot of things going on. So I'm glad that I'm just like, let me just go ahead and sit down, try to get one of these out for you guys so you can have extra content to well, watch on the channel. I really appreciate anybody who is patient enough to wait for these to come out and really just binge and enjoy them. So, without further ado, this is supposed to be a three SCP Foundation horror stories. I'm not sure what SCP is, um, but the thumbnail looks terrifying. So, we're gonna find out. Um, yeah, and again, we're playing this without any ads. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Without further ado, let's go and get into the shit. I am Samuel. Hi, Sam. And this is not exactly my story, but unfortunately, I ended up being a part of it. A few months back, I went on a hiking trip in Bloomington, Indiana with my three friends, Betty, Jason, and Molly. We studied in the same high school and often met each other during the holidays. There is a park in Bloomington named McCormick's Creek State Park. The park is the oldest park in the state of Indiana. There's a magnificent waterfall, many caves, and deep woods, making the park an ideal spot for campers. We visited the waterfall and clicked some pictures in front of it. The location was amazing. Half the time of the day, we went wandering around. After walking for a long time, we decided to rest for a while and then look for a spot to camp for the night. Betty sat down on a big rock and said, loving this place, we agreed with her. Jason started to record videos on his phone uh -huh. while I took out a sandwich from my backpack to eat. The birds were chirping around us. I could hear the sound of splashing water coming from the waterfall in the dip. I'm just waiting to see where this is going to all go left. Because this looks really happy and tranquil right about now. Okay, so when does the boogeyman come out? Because I'm sure it's coming. Instance, Molly and Betty were sitting close to me and laughing. I was enjoying the view when suddenly I heard Jason's voice. Whoa, what the hell is this? Molly got up and asked, what? What happened, Jason? Uh-oh, mood change. We saw Jason standing behind a bush and watching something. He said in a loud voice, come, and see for yourself. We got up and went towards his direction. As soon as I reached the near bush, the hair at the back of my neck stood up. There was a medium-sized animal skull lying on the ground. It seemed like a deer or something of that sort. It had horns and a bad smell as well. The weird part was the lower jaw of the skull was missing. There was only the upper side, which made it look like a huge spooky mask. We all kept staring at it with surprised eyes. How long has this thing been here? Jason said. Betty replied, well, some animal might have died and left it here. I couldn't help but laugh at her sarcasm. Jason replied in an irritating voice. I know that. Jason got down and went to touch it, but something really unexpected happened. As he stretched his hand towards the skull, the skull suddenly moved away. Oh, bitch, nope. Mm -mm. Nope. All right, girls, let's pack it on up because we shouldn't have been out here in the damn woods in the first place. Um, This thing is haunted, but no, hold on, hold on. Why should there be like a squirrel or some shit underneath that? Now, if there ain't no squirrel underneath that, bitch, punt that shit as hard as you can and run. Oh, my God. Did it move on its own? Betty said with shocking eyes. We were all equally shocked to witness this incident. I said, uh, well, there could be a rat or a small animal underneath it. See? Betty replied, ew. There could be maggots, too. Whatever it is, I don't want to be near this shit. Molly said, Come on, guys, let's go and camp for the night. This is just a stupid skull of a dead animal, and it's creeping me out, too. 
Honestly, the skull made me uncomfortable too. There was something about it that didn't feel right. We all took our backpacks and started to walk away. But as I turned back, I saw Jason was still standing there and watching it without even blinking for even a second. The fuck? I said in a loud voice, Jason, come on, we gotta go. He said hesitantly, yeah, coming. We walked for another this 15 man's minutes hypnotized. and chose a favorable site for camping. Everyone got busy arranging their tents, but Jason sat down on the ground and kept looking at the horizon. He became awfully quiet all of a sudden. I sat beside him and handed him a beer. He took the beer and then said in a confused tone, you did see the skull move on its own. Right, Sam? I said, come on, Jason. You're still thinking about that skull? We came here to have some fun. Let it be, man. The sun started to set and darkness took over. I arranged some wood and lit a fire for our barbecue. Molly brought some marinated chicken. Using a stick, we started to roast it in the fire. We were drinking beer and enjoying the silence around us. The crackling sound of the fire, mixed with the crickets, made for a spooky ambiance. Suddenly, we came to realize that Jason is nowhere to be seen. Betty said, um, where is Jason? I told her that he was sitting on the rock a few moments back. Molly got up and said in a tensed voice, where did he go then? We should look for him. I tried to call his cell phone, but there was no network in that area. Duh, bitch. <laughs> man, if he knew any better, if he knew any better, he knew that that man went right back to where that skull was. I feel like that man got possessed by something, child. I feel like he gonna go crazy on them and try to kill them was got possessed some shit. I bet you it is. We already set the camp up, and leaving all of our stuff would not have been a smart move. So I told Betty, why don't you stay here in case Jason comes back? Meanwhile, Molly and I will go look for him. Betty agreed, and we started to search for Jason. Jason! Molly shouted, but no reply came back. The park was in complete darkness. We were using our flashlights to make our way. The pale moonlight created an environment of light and shadow. Every time I stepped in the rusty leaves, I felt like someone was watching me. I don't know why I felt that way, because I didn't see anyone around. Where the hell did he go, Sam? Molly asked in a tiring voice. I said in a worried voice, I don't know. He seemed disturbed from the moment he discovered that animal skull. It will be hard to find him in this darkness because, but before I could finish my sentence, oh, bitch. a terrifying scream took place. Molly said in a panic. I'm telling you, it, that man came back possessed. I'm telling you. Panic's voice. Isn't that Betty? Without wasting a single second, we started to run towards the campsite. I knew Betty was in trouble. The scream I just heard was nothing but a cry for help. We were running like madmen. Bushy leaves and wild trees pierced our skins as we ran through them. It took us five to seven minutes to reach the campsite. Damn, how far did y'all go? <laughs> if you're running to full speed and it still took you five minutes to get back, damn. But as soon as we did, the blood in our veins turned into ice. What? Betty was lying on the ground near the campfire. Her eyes were wide open and still. There was blood all over her body. And she had no arms. Yes, Betty's arms were missing. As if someone ripped her arms like a broken twig. Molly screamed at the top of her lungs witnessing this oh vicious sight. Lord. I didn't know what to do at that moment. Because I've never seen a death like that. But before we could even make up our minds and take control of the situation, the ultimate horror took place. We heard a sound of munching coming from behind a tent nearby. No. I picked up a wooden branch. Oh, no, no, no. You know it's Jason that munched on that girl. No. <laughs> from the ground, because I knew that the creature that killed our friend is still among us. I told Molly to keep quiet, and we slowly tiptoed towards the tent nearby. We? What you mean, we? You think, bitch, Molly, you stupid girl. That would be nowhere near that damn thing. Shit. I hope you have a weapon too, girl. As we peeked behind it, my stomach dropped. A 
horrifying creature was chewing flesh of a human arm. It goes without saying, those were Betty's arms. The creature was sitting on his legs like a human figure. Due to the darkness around him, it was hard to see it clearly. But the way he was chewing and feeding on that human flesh, it scared the shit out of me. Molly couldn't hold it anymore and started to vomit on the ground. The creature immediately turned at us and my flashlight fell on his face. What I saw, I will never be able to forget. It was a human-like figure, but instead of a human face, it had an animal skull. The same skull we saw in the afternoon while hiking near the waterfall. The skull covered half of its face, but I could still see its bloody, vicious mouth. There were thousands of sharp teeth coming out of it. Blood was dripping from it. The creature got up and made a spine-chilling growl. We took steps back, but I knew our end was near. There's no way Molly and I can defeat this hound from hell. Hey, Miles look weird looking like... <laughs> I know it's supposed to be scary, but it just... I don't know. Hell. It's bony, pigmented skin made me nauseous. Oh, so it's not and Jason. sharp claws with long nails were enough to... Okay, so that's not Jason. Where the hell did he go? Is he going to save him out of the blue right now, or what? Slice my throat off in a wink. I prayed to God to save us from this thing. The creature kept growling and taking small steps towards us. Its nature was just like a predator. It crouched on the ground in an attempt to make its final jump. We were so scared and shocked at that moment that we forgot to run. We knew it was going to hurl on us. Bitch, one thing I couldn't, I don't know if I could ever be so scared as to just not start running. I, I, I cannot relate to how that happens. <laughs> and no one will ever know what happened to four young boys and girls who came for camping. I was sure this same creature killed our friend Jason too, when suddenly my eyes went to the left arm of this creature. My friend Jason had a tattoo of an anchor on his left arm, and this evil demon standing right in front of me had the same tattoo on his left arm too. I screamed at the huh? top of my lungs. Oh my God, Jason, is this you? What happened to you? Why are you trying to kill your own friends? Jason laughed in his demonic voice and said, <laughs> I'm hungry. So hungry. I need to feed. He then jumped on me and pierced his claw into my stomach. Oh. I screamed in pain and said, Run! Molly, run! But suddenly, out of nowhere, a group of four or five men came out in front of us. They were dressed in spacesuit-like costume. None of their faces were visible. They pointed a laser gun and fired at Jason. Making a last and final growl, Jason's body fell lifelessly on the ground. As soon as he fell on the ground, the animal skull came off his head on its own. Those men nursed my wound. Molly was lying unconscious on the ground. They took the skull inside a closed box. I said in a painful voice, Who are you all? What happened to my friend? What is this animal skull? They didn't reply to me. They started to walk away after taking the skull with them. What? Except one guy turned towards me and said, We have called the cops. They will be at your rescue. He then turned towards another member of his crew and said, Call General and tell him we have successfully managed to capture SCP-323. Tell him to keep the cell ready for its containment. I don't know who they were and what happened to my friend, but we told the cops how an animal attack changed our lives into a living nightmare. What? I still have so many unanswered questions that keep me awake at night. Girl, bye. I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. After my parents on... Uh, oh. Yeah, what? Okay, is SCP gonna be like skull captured predator or some shit? Girl. Damn, that sucks that, that that girl got left by herself and got fucked up. Unfortunate death. I lost my house for not being able to pay the rent. I was on the verge of living on the streets. One evening, I was sitting in the city park. I had no idea of what to do with my life. Just then, I heard a familiar voice. I looked up and saw Candace standing at some distance. 
She was my classmate in high school. She came for a run in the park. Hey, Beth, where have you been? She came towards me with a surprised face. I smiled awkwardly. She sat down beside me and said, Beth, is everything all right? You don't look good. I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears and told her about my miserable life. Candace calmed me down and took me to her apartment. She was working in a cafe. She told me I could crash at her place until I found a job. I started looking for jobs, any job that I could find. I used to walk all over town looking for one opportunity to earn money. One day, I was working part-time in a departmental store when Candace called me. I took her call and she said, Hey, Beth, can you come home quick? I just got a permanent job for you. This might help you. I finished my work as soon as possible and headed for home. Candace told me she met a guy in the cafe today. The guy said he works in an institution as a researcher. They have valuable specimens and are looking for helpers for night shifts. Candace added, I know how desperately you wanted to get back to your studies. You should go and see this place. I think this might be your chance, Beth. Even though working the night shift can be a bit unsafe for a woman, Candace was right. All I wanted was to save for my studies mm. so that I could have a dignified life ahead. I took the phone number from Candace and dialed it. The phone rang for a few seconds. Then a man picked it up. Hello, how may I help you? The man said in a serious voice. I explained how I wanted to apply for the night job and every other detail. The man said he is going to text me the address and a time for an interview tomorrow. After hanging up the call, I received a text from the same number. The text read, IMR Research and Training Facility, 2021 Subscribe Street. I went to bed with hope and excitement after a very long time. I fell asleep thinking tomorrow is the day. Baby, let me tell you, I could never do the night shift of a job, new no girl. I, I'll do the morning, I'll even do like the midday, but the night shift? Mm mm. I can't, like, it's like almost two o'clock in the morning right now. I can't imagine having just started my shift like two, three hours ago. No. <laughs> that can help me start my life all over again. The next morning, I got dressed and went to the address the man gave me. The place looked like a hospital, except the staff appeared to be researchers and... Girl, you came dressed for an interview in a blouse? Or like a... in jeans? Uh... Okay. Scientists. I called the man again, and he told me to wait near the main gate. After two, three minutes, an average height man came out wearing a lab coat. He said, Hello. You must be Beth. I am Jonathan. Please, come with me. As I entered the facility, I saw patients here and there, except all of them seemed highly sedated. Most of them were strapped to wheelchairs. I saw an old woman sitting on a bench nearby. She was dozing off unnaturally. I asked Jonathan, Um, what is this place? He replied, this is a mental institution, but not just any mental institution. Along with sheltering patients, we run tests on them too. Let's go to my office. Test. I will tell you in detail. On my way to Jonathan's office, I realized why he picked a random girl like me for this job. I was sure that these people do many things which can be termed as illegal. Probably this is why he was looking for an amateur who wouldn't be a threat to their scientific research. We got into his cabin and sat down to talk. Jonathan told me they have only a few patients here, as most of them have already been shifted to a new place. It's a matter of one month, and they will shift the rest of them too. I asked in a surprised voice, but Candace told me this is a permanent job. Jonathan smiled and said, Look, Beth, you seem like a smart girl. I hope you have already figured out that some of our research activities can be identified as non-governmental. Hence why we have to shift to a more secluded place to run them smoothly. You will be assigned to a specific job. If you manage to get through that and still want to work with us, we can assure you a guaranteed employment no matter where we go. 
We will pay you a handsome salary, too. Everything he said sounded so nice to me. But the work Girl, no. Any place that has to give you doing illegal shit, you ain't gonna get no real kind of 401k. You ain't gonna get no real insurance. They might be able to pay you a salary, but it's not... It, I feel like they're gonna be doing tax fraud and some other shit. Girl, no. Don't bother. Word, specific <clears throat> job got my attention. I said in a confused voice, um, what kind of job? Jonathan said, we have a few female patients who are too old to care for themselves. Irrespective of medical supervision, they need extra care. So you will be appointed to work four hour night shifts regularly until we shift them to a new facility. The work sounded like being a helper to these elderly women. So I agreed and it was a hell of a lot of money. I came home, packed a few things, and left for my night shift. At night, the facility looked creepy. Jonathan handed me the room keys for three female patients and their food charts and medicine details. I was talking to him when suddenly my eyes went to a large iron bolted door at the end of the corridor. The nameplate on the door read, Caution, SCP-082. I couldn't understand this weird coding system, I'm about to so I asked SCP Jonathan, is. what is behind that door? As soon as I asked him the question, he looked at the door and I saw his face turn pale. He then said in a low voice, that is a restricted area. You must stay away from that door. Tomorrow we are going to shift him. I said, him? Is he a patient like the others? Jonathan looked at me and said, I have given you all the details you need for your work. See you tomorrow, Beth. All the best. I couldn't ask him more because he left the conversation abruptly. I started my job without thinking more about the room with the iron door. I fed the women and put them to sleep after giving them their medication. I decided to sit on the bench in the corridor and watch some YouTube videos to spend the last bit of my night shift in peace. I don't remember when I dozed off, but suddenly I woke up hearing a sobbing voice. It sounded like a man was whimpering in pain. Oh, no, I got God. up and started to follow the sound. As soon as I came near the iron door, the sobbing stopped. I said in a hesitant voice, No. Hello? Are you all right? No reply came back. I turned around to go back to my seat just when I heard a voice coming from behind the door. Are you new here? A man spoke. I replied, yes, I just joined today. The man then said in a painful voice, my stomach hurts. They haven't fed me for days. Please, help me. I said in a surprised voice, what? Why didn't they feed you? The man then replied, this is how they torture people for scientific experiments. Don't you know that? I suddenly felt very bad for the guy. Girl, that man told you to stay far away from that shit. <laughs> and you know that that man is probably trying to coerce you into opening that door and he gonna snatch you up and do all kind of shit. So if you about to be this naive and believe this man, I, you should just go on and mind your own business, girl. This is not a part of your job description. This is above my pay grade. <laughs> not dealing with, and plus, it, why is it so dark? Why does it have to be so dark? Y'all better put on a hall light or something. I know these people are trying to sleep and whatnot, but y'all better have a hall light on. We ain't about to just be walking down in the, uh, the, the dungeon and shit. No. I said in an awkward voice, but I can't open the door. It's locked. How am I supposed to pass you food then? The man then said, You see the red button beside the door? Press it. The security system will turn off for a while. And then I will be able to unlock this door. I had no idea my one stupid mistake would change everything. You dumb bitch. Why do you think the door was locked, girl? Did you ever not stop to think they probably locked this door for a reason? They probably want to keep this door that's at the end of the hallway that's somehow different and more secure than any other door in this building for a reason? Like, I can't even feel sorry for you at this point. Whatever happens to you, girl, happens. Out of pity and sorrow for the patient. Don't forget stupidity. 
Don't forget stupidity. I opened the glass lid covering the red button on the wall and pressed the button. The entire facility shut down in a wink. The corridor went into complete darkness as the electricity went off immediately. For a second, there was pin drop silence everywhere. And suddenly, a loud thud appeared right next to my ear. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and saw the thick iron door had been crushed like a piece of paper. Girl. Amidst the pitch black darkness, I heard a demonic laughter. Instantly, I realized why Jonathan told me to stay away from this door. I realized I made a huge mistake Dumbass. by stepping into the trap of this patient behind the door. And now I have set him free. I said in a scared voice, Please go inside. You must abide by the rules of this place. A voice spoke from the darkness. You look too young for this job, Beth. My stomach dropped. And suddenly, the lights came back on. The alarms started to go off in the entire facility. Four to five guards, dressed in protective suits, arrived from the security room. One of them screamed, saying, What have you done? And I saw a gigantic figure standing at the end of the hallway, smirking at me with its blood red eyes. Two guards Girl, rushed towards bye. the giant, trying to stop him, but he grabbed one of them by the neck and smashed his skull with his bare hands. One by one, he killed all of them. I was stunned. Wait a minute, didn't they come with weapons? Did not one of them shoot? Did I see? Y'all came with weapons, right? If I go back, y'all came with girl. Frozen in shock, he everybody in this bitch is dumb. Then grabbed a dead guard from the floor and looked right into my eyes. He smiled for the last time and said, "Sorry for not introducing myself earlier. I am Fernand, the cannibal. Thanks, Beth." I hope to see you again. He then kicked the wall in front of me and escaped the facility. I fainted on the floor, screaming out loud. The next morning, Candace came to visit me in the hospital. She told me the entire facility had been shut down in just one night. Cops are saying it was some kind of secret laboratory for extremely violent research processes. They have found a few dead bodies, but and then your motherfucking ass the one that sent me to the shit. Girl, bye, get away from me, whore. You can't be trusted either. So I got a job for you. I can feel like it can be permanent work. Didn't look any further into it than a, probably a simple Google. Girl, you sent me to a crazy house where the man could have eaten me alive. Get away from me. No one could identify those men. I don't know what happened to Jonathan and where Fernand is now. I don't even know why he was referred to as SCP-082. But whatever it was, I'm done with night shifts for my entire life. Okay. Girl, please. Do you Eddie moved into their new house with his parents. He was extremely excited. This house is way bigger than their previous apartment. It even has a big lake at the back of the house. He liked playing near the lake in the afternoons on holidays, though his mom told him not to go to the lake alone. Eddie never listened. People hardly go to this lake. Maybe that's why it appears so attractive to Eddie. He sits on the bank of the lake and dangles his feet into the still, cold water. The water reflects everything like a mirror. Eddie looks at the water and makes faces and ends up laughing on his own. Long trees surround the lake. With the slow wind passing by, Eddie could see those trees moving as if they were dancing. Every holiday afternoon, Eddie secretly sneaks out of the house and comes here. One Sunday, Eddie was standing near the lake and skipping stones into the water. Suddenly, he saw something in the middle of the lake. He tried to look more closely, and what he saw shocked him. There was a hand Floating on the lake, the hand wasn't moving, just floating still. Eddie asked in a surprised voice, Hey, do you need help? The 
Girl, my floating... <laughs> Girl, my floating dead corpse hand is just so happened to be just floating above the water. And you think you're asking me now, do I need help? Help is long gone, girl. That ship has sailed. <laughs> that person is dead, girl. Hand didn't move. And he asked again. Hello? Can you hear me? The hand went underwater and disappeared. A thought came to his mind. What if someone is drowning? Eddie ran to the house to call his dad. He bolted inside the house, slamming the door so hard that his mom screamed. Ed, is that you? Is everything okay? Eddie said in a panicked voice, Dad, a man is drowning in the lake. Eddie's dad was watching TV, sitting on the couch. He got up and said, What? What are you saying? Eddie went to him and started pulling his hand. Yes, come on. You have to save him. He called me for help. Eddie and his dad ran to the lake, but by the time they reached the lake, there was no one to be found. The lake water was still, and the slow wind was passing by. Eddie searched with his curious eyes, but he didn't see anyone or that mysterious hand. His dad scolded him for coming to the lake alone and making up stories. They went back to the house and Eddie went to his room with an angry face. He remembers- I never understood why parents feel like, oh, they're just making up stories. Like usually if kids are like that frantic and scared, I'm gonna take it with an ounce of truth, to be honest. I'll, I'll keep it in the back of my mind. I'm not just gonna dismiss it. Cause I felt like they probably, I mean, there's no reason why they wouldn't see something. This is just a new place we just moved into. We don't know shit about that damn lake. The hell, for all we know, there could be the Loch Ness Monster child. But let's see how we go. Seeing the hand, the entire night, Eddie couldn't sleep. He had a dream that he was standing near the lake and the hand was calling him. The next morning he woke up. He heard the sound of cop cars near their house. He rushed downstairs. He saw Mrs. Mullins crying on their doorstep and his mother was consoling her. The cop was asking her questions and the other two cops were patrolling the area around the house. Eddie couldn't understand what was going on. He asked his dad, Dad, what happened? Why is Mrs. Mullins crying? Eddie's dad took him to the living room and said in a low voice, Ed, you can't sneak out of the house anymore. Our gardener, Mr. Mullins, has gone missing since yesterday. The cops are saying someone abducted him. We all need to be very careful. Eddie said in a loud voice, That hand, Dad! I saw the hand of the lake. A cop heard him and came to him. He asked Eddie, what are you saying? Eddie's father explained how Eddie came home yesterday and said he saw someone drowning in the lake, but they checked the lake and there was no one. The cops went to search the lake, but it was so deep that they couldn't. They interrogated people in that area, but no one could claim they saw Mr. Mullins going to the lake. A week passed by and Eddie didn't go to the lake. One Sunday afternoon, his dad was away from home. It was just Eddie and his mother in the house. Eddie peeked into his mother's room and saw her sleeping. He then slowly opened the main door and tiptoed out of the house. After shutting the door behind him, he ran towards the lake. Why? Why? <laughs> Why would you do that? For what reason? Do you want to get snatched too? Like, what? Someone help me to understand. Is it just me? Am I just being a scaredy cat or am I just being smart? The lake stood like a mirror. He went close to the water and started searching. He said in a worried voice, is there anyone here? Suddenly, he saw a movement in the water. Eddie got close to the water to look properly. And then he gets closer. <sighs> Girl, you about to get snatched up too. His feet got submerged in the water. He asked. Now watch this. Watch his ass get yanked and pulled up under there and ain't nobody gonna find his ass either. Watch. Who are you? Why aren't you coming out of the water? But before he could even get his answers, he 
something very unexpected happened. He saw two burning pairs of eyes emerge from the water, looking at him. The eyes were so big that Eddie froze in fear. The eyes... What the fuck is that? ...slowly started to get close to Eddie. When it was three to four hands distance from him, Eddie saw the lake water rise like a huge wave. The water was churning like a tsunami. As the creature came out, Eddie couldn't believe his eyes. The gigantic mon... Oh, bitch. <laughs> Wait, how did they get so big? And girl, these this frozen in fear shit, I don't understand. Run. Monster came out of the water. It was so huge that Eddie felt like an ant in front of it. It growled like a demon from hell and opened its huge mouth full of sharp teeth. Eddie fell on the riverbank, hitting his head on the mud. He tried to scream, but the monster was just about to devour him. Suddenly, his eyes went to a small thing from the monster's mouth. It was a sliced hand. We been new. We be, child, what are you about to be next? God, it means this giant ate Mr. Mullins. Yeah. Eddie couldn't breathe from the shock and fear of this incident. He felt like he was going to die, and this creature was going to drag him into the deep, dark bottom of the lake. Yeah. Eddie was falling unconscious just when he felt someone grab him and pull him out of the lake vigorously. He saw with his blurry vision that his mom was panting and crying. Then everything went black. Eddie woke up with a high fever after two days. The doctors told him to rest completely. His parents left the house after one week. On the day that Eddie was leaving his house with his parents, he went to the lake for a few seconds. <laughs> just... I just don't know. <laughs> okay. This is just basically suicide at this point. There is not even... This isn't even like a... Oh, this... Uh, scary movie, intense... You know, building tension and all that bullshit. No. No, 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 no. If I just saw... The fucking Loch Ness Monster come out and almost devour me whole... From this lake. Why? Oh, why? Under what circumstance would you then go back to said lake? Why? Uh, someone in the comments, please tell me why. Tell, tell me why. <laughs> there was no one there, but suddenly... When he turned around to leave, he saw two people walking away by the riverbank. They were dressed in a funky manner, more like astronauts. Eddie heard them saying, SCP-1128 has now moved to the main ocean. We have got to capture it before it takes any more innocent lives. Suddenly, Eddie's father called him from the car. Come on, Ed, it's getting late. Eddie ran towards the car and left the lake house forever. But every night, he sees nightmares of the giant sea monster roaming in oceans and devouring everything with its sharp, vigorous teeth. That don't, that, that right there is just dumbassery. That's just... <laughs> oh my God. Okay. But anyways, thank you all again for watching. Um, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Tell me what y'all think it is because some of that shit was just dumb. That was <laughs> that was just stupid. But you know what? Be that as it may, it is what it is. I will see y'all later. I hope you have a great rest of your evenings, and I'll see y'all next time. Peace out.